Um, está bien así? ¿Se escucha bien? Um, so I'm going to tell you, give you kind of an, a little bit of an overview of a lot of different work that uh, we've done in the lab, and there'll be a little bit of overlap with uh, what <coughs> Virginia already told you about. Uh, I just want to start with a question that you probably are already convinced of this, so I don't need to convince you. But um, basically the reason we study music is because I think of it from a neuroscience point of view that what we're trying to do is understand the function of the brain and that music gives us a unique kind of a window onto many different um, cognitive functions and that by studying it, um, it reveals something about uh, the brain but also for the people who are interested in music, it might reveal something about music. That's our hope. This is good. And I, I like to play this. Uh, you are interested in evolution, so I think I'll play this for you. You may already be familiar with this work. Um, these are uh, prehistoric flutes that were found in China in a cave. And they're made from the bone, from the femur of a, of a stork, kind of a wading bird. Uh, and they're something like uh, 7,000 years old, I think, something like that. But what's amazing about them is that they can actually be played. And this is what they sound like. It's just amazing how good that sounds, right? Um, it's a very beautiful sound. Of course, uh, you know, they found these flutes. They did not find the um, DVD recording <laughs> next to it. <laughs> so we have no idea about the, the music that was played on it. However, we do have a very good idea from this of the timbre of the instrument, but also of the scale structure, because the scale is given by the distance between the holes. And so we know that they were using a pentatonic scale already 7,000 years ago, which is pretty remar remarkable. So it also means, of course, that um, uh, music is a very ancient uh, part of the human species. And uh, there are older flutes than this uh, that can't really be played, but uh, are thought to be um, uh, perhaps even dating back to Neanderthal times. So now what we try to do in the lab is we try to understand this relationship between how this thing produces these behaviors that we try to measure. She's one of our very good participants uh, in the experiment there. Um, and as I said, what's interesting about music is that it can, um, it allows us to study all these interesting uh, cognitive abilities, in particular perceptual abilities, which is something I'll talk about uh, quite a lot today. Motor abilities, we've already heard a lot about that from Virginia. Uh, memory, I won't talk about so much. Emotion, I will talk a little bit about uh, later on. But uh, as I said, I think it gives us a very unique um, opportunity to study these different uh, cognitive abilities outside of the usual kinds of contexts in which they are, they are studied. Because if you look in your psychology textbook, you'll see a chapter for every one of these items but when you read in there, it's almost all about vision or about language. That's the way people seem to study things like memory or things like emotion. Um, so it's nice to get a different angle on it. That's what we try to do. And um, we study brain structural and functional properties and try to relate them uh, to these behaviors. Um, and we do this by using both a functional MRI, which measures brain activity, anatomical MRI, as Virginia mentioned, and also um, sometimes we use PET, a positive sound emission tomography, to look at brain chemistry. And uh, finally, this is a two-way street so that the brain not only produces the behaviors, but also the behaviors influence brain structure and function. So this makes it an interesting kind of a loop to uh, go through. So these are the three questions that I'm going to try to address here. Uh, I may have to compress it a little bit. So the first question is whether there's any evidence for uh, any kind of specialization for music, in particular if there's specialization for pitch. Then I'll speak very briefly about imagery, 
and then creativity, and then at the end about emotion. For those of you who are not so familiar with uh, the auditory uh, portions of the brain, um, this is the temporal lobe, and you can think of the uh, auditory regions as being found within the superior portion of the temporal lobe, and they're organized in this sort of concentric manner. And from there, um, we know that there are different streams of uh, processing, some of which go ventrally and anteriorly, and others of which go dorsally, and that will become important uh, later on in understanding some of the results. So let me start just, uh, again, I'd like to play some musical examples. Um, I want to demonstrate a phenomenon for you, which also gives me an opportunity to play some Bach. This is uh, Glenn Gould playing the aria from um, the Goldberg Variations. that if I play enough music during the talk, people won't remember the content, but later they'll say, oh, it was such a great talk. <laughs> um, so that sounds very nice. Now, suppose that I apply a filter to this stimulus, and I remove most of the energy below about 1,000 hertz. So this is a high-pass filter. And um, so 1,000 hertz corresponds approximately to the high C there, the do. And uh, if I do that, it sounds like this. doesn't sound that different, right? You can still hear the melody perfectly well. So how does that work? Why is it that you can hear the melody? Well, it's because your auditory system is somehow uh, computing the pitch that corresponds to those tones on the basis of the upper harmonics that are present in the piano. So I've removed the, frequency, the, the energy in the frequency band that corresponds to the pitch that you're hearing, but you're brain fills it in on the basis of the um, harmonics. And this is a phenomenon that's been known for... Yes, I removed the fundamental frequency, but the multiples remain. So if this note, for example, uh, here is, let's say, 800 hertz, it's been removed. But 1600 and... Um, 2400 and 3200, they're all there. The overtones are there. And that's what your brain is using. Um, and so this phenomenon has been known for a long time. And uh, it forms the basis for one of the first experiments I ever did, way back in the, not quite as old as those flutes, but it's 1988, um, prehistoric time. And uh, what we did was we studied patients who had excisions of a portion of the auditory cortex. and um, I want to just illustrate for you this structure here is called Heschel's gyrus. And um, these patients have a lesion extending into the lateral portion. So Heschel's gyrus is like a finger, and it's just a lateral portion that's been removed surgically in these epilepsy patients. And uh, I won't go through the, the task, but it involved uh, listening to tones that did not have a fundamental frequency. And basically, the finding is that, um, sorry, these patients with this kind of excision had a large number of errors compared to patients that had lesions elsewhere, particularly on the left side. This is only on the right. Patients with lesions on the left side were actually uh, not impaired at all. And even those who had lesions on the right side but that was more anterior, that did not include that particular region, um, did not have uh, uh, very poor performance. So this is one of the first pieces of evidence that suggested that there might be some specialization in this portion of auditory cortex. And this was, um, I won't say it's confirmed exactly, but uh, mo much more recent evidence uh, that seems to uh, be in, in uh, line with this comes from uh, Bender and Wang, who recorded neurons in the marmoset monkey brain. And they found um, these squares here represent neurons that had a very interesting property, which is that they respond in a very invariant fashion, as you see here, 
they always respond the same way, to stimuli that are very different in frequency content, but that have in common that they all are multiples with the same fundamental. So here you have the one with the fundamental. So this is, let's say, um, 100, 200, 300 hertz. This is 4, 5, and 600. This is 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so forth. So as long as those um, stimuli correspond to that fundamental, even if it's not present, these neurons respond in exactly the same way. And where they're found is lateral to A1, and A1 is the four area. Um, and so this would be roughly corresponding to the human, um, to where the human lesions are. So these lesions here are on the more lateral portion, and this is more lateral than the uh, core area there. So there's a reasonable correspondence there. So this again suggests that there's some kind of specialization. And uh, just to give you another example that converges onto the same sort of finding, this is again from uh, work that Krista Hyde did in our lab. And this is using functional MRI. And what we do here is a very simple experiment. We have this pattern of tones that goes up and down. And we vary the size of the um, pitch change. So this would be a large pitch change, for example. And this would be a very small pitch change. If you can't hear that, come tell me after the talk. We'll put you in the scanner. Um, so what we did in this experiment was we simply, um, like I said, we varied the size of that pitch change. And we looked everywhere in the brain for voxels whose activity, both signal, um, correlated with the amount of change. So we're looking everywhere. And what we find is one spot that shows a very strong relationship to this change of pitch. And that region is located um, in a similar location. It's not quite exactly the same. But it's on, it's on the right side. And it's lateral and slightly posterior to the primary auditory cortex. So it seems to be converging with the lesion evidence and with the uh, neurophysiological evidence that there's some kind of specialization going on here. So we think that, yes, there are areas that are specialized for pitch. And because we have that evidence, we can now ask the question, how are they related to training? And so for this, we use a technique which Virginia already mentioned, which is this voxel-based morphometry technique where we're looking at gray matter concentration. And this is work done by Patrick Bermudez. And uh, what he did was very simple. We took a large group of musically trained people, a large group of people without musical training. We scanned them all. And then we just compared their scans. That's it. Very simple. And then we look at every voxel. We look everywhere in the brain. And we look for the places where there's a maximum difference in the concentration of gray matter. And where the maximum difference is, is exactly where in those previous studies, well, not exactly, but close enough, um, in those previous studies, we had seen evidence for specialization of pitch. So we think this is, again, nice convergence that the area which seems to respond to pitch is also the area which is most highly uh, distinguishing the musically trained people from the musically untrained people. Now, this uh, specific uh, finding raises two questions. First of all, is there any predictive validity in relation to behavior? And because we're uh, psychologists were always trying to understand something about behavior. Um, and the second question is whether th uh, those differences that we've seen, this difference is uh, a consequence of training, which is one possibility, or might there be um, a pre-existing difference? In other words, might that difference already um, be antecedent <coughs> to training? And that's a more difficult question to answer. So to um, address this question of the behavioral uh, relevance, we designed a behavioral task which we thought would be relevant for the analysis and processing of pitch. This was Nick Foster who developed this. And um, the way it works is you hear a target melody. And then it will be followed by another melody which is transposed. So it's in a different key. It's um, uh, moved up. And your job is to say, is the target melody and the comparison melody is it really the same melody, or is there an alteration? Is there one note that's wrong? So if I play this target, 
play this transposed version. It's not right. It's good. This is the right one. Okay. Here's another example. Okay, there is a wrong note in there, so you're pretty good at this, but not everyone is so good at it. In fact, if we take an unselected population, if we go out on the campus here and take 100 students, you will find people who are performing at 99% correct and people who are performing at 50% correct and everything in between. So this is great because we designed it to be this way because we wanted a large amount of variance to see whether we in fact could explain that variance based on the dynamic range. So we um, gave this test to 60 or 70 people and then we used the score which ranges from 50 to 100. We used that score as a regressor on the uh, brain imaging anatomical data. And what you see is actually this is the, the same data that Virginia already showed you in a slightly different format. So again, we look everywhere in the brain and we look for the voxels whose gray matter concentration is predictive of behavior. And this is the relationship between gray matter and behavioral task performance. Each of these dots is one person. And you can see that there's a reasonable correlation here and that that correlation is expressed most highly in that one spot, which is very similar to the spot that I showed you earlier. This is the region which differentiates musically trained from musically untrained people. And a very similar region um, permits me to make some uh, prediction with respect to behavior on a musically relevant task. Uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. So is this a fact the consequence of training is the obvious question. We don't really know the answer. Um, but here's one piece of information. So I already showed you this a moment ago. Um, within this sample of people, some of them had a lot of training and some of them did not have so much musical training. Um, and so we thought, well, could that uh, account for it? In other words, is the amount of training what's driving this effect? So we computed the amount of training they had had, and then we simply removed it from the equation. We just factored it out um, using a simple linear model. And what happens is that you still get the same effect when you look at behavior. Sorry, behavior is over here. So we're now we're looking at essentially the residuals, behavioral performance after factoring out musical training. And that score is still predicted in the same region. It's a lot weaker than it was, which means that training um, does account for part of this variance, but it doesn't account for all of the variance. Even after I take train, training into account, I can still explain some of the variance on the basis of brain structure uh, in relation to behavior. So that suggests that um, maybe there might be pre-existing differences that the training might interact with, but it's not entirely training uh, driven. Um, now the second topic here is about imagery for music and um, it sort of follows from this because the idea of identifying specializations in the brain helps us really to interpret a lot of other data that might otherwise be difficult to interpret. So um, imagery is something that we've been working on for a while. Um, with my colleague Andrea Halpern, and we might define it as the ability to evoke music when it's not present. And uh, the maybe the best example ever in history is Beethoven, because of course you know that he was very deaf by the end of his life. Um, he was so deaf that he, when people came to speak to him, he couldn't hear them at all, and so they had to write down their questions, and he would read them, and then he would write his answers. And you can still see these, these uh, conversation books, they're called. They're in the museum in Bonn, the uh, Beethoven Museum. This shows how deaf he was. He absolutely couldn't even hear someone, you know, shouting in his ear. Uh, and yet he could compose uh, amazing music. So he must have had a very, very strong internal um, representation of musical sound. So how do we test this behaviorally? Well, there are various different uh, tricks that we've used. Um, 
One of them that we developed a few years ago, um, I won't go into the details, but we asked people to listen to different uh, instrument sounds, like saxophone, trumpet, bassoon, clarinet, and we ma made them, uh, we asked them to make judgments about how different they sounded. And from those judgments, we developed a multidimensional scaling solution, which tells you the distances on this graph represent the, distance, the perceptual distances between those items. And the only reason we did that was so that we can compare perceiving the sounds to just imagining the sounds. So here we play a tenor sax and a violin, and we ask for a judgment. And here we simply tell the person, imagine a tenor sax. Now imagine a violin sound. How different are they? And when we do that, we get very similar solutions. Um, not identical, but reasonably similar. So the thing is a little bit different here. Uh, and so that is uh, one way to demonstrate that there is a psychological reality to this imagery. It's not just that people say that they have imagery. They're, they have information in their imagery, which we can probe with this sort of technique. So we did this while people were being scanned in the fMRI scanner. And um, this is what happens when you are perceiving the sounds. Of course, the auditory cortex is strongly active, stronger on the right than on the left. Here's what's happening when you imagine the sounds. So again, we see some auditory cortex as, as, long as, as well as frontal regions. And the conjunction just represents the overlap of these two. So these are voxels that are in common between these two conditions. And this demonstrates that areas of the auditory cortex, which are driven by real sound, that actually goes in your ear, are also active when there is no sound, and you're just imagining what's going on. What's new in the next few days, probably a year, when you hear the term global global contact? This? And the voxels are going to be the This, uh, right here, is probably the precuneus, so it's a cortical structure. Yeah. And, um, not sure about that, but the frontal regions are something we've seen in subsequent studies, specifically during imagery. Because with imagery, unlike perception, there's a retrieval component. So in other words, if I ask you, imagine the sound of a violin, well, that information is somehow stored in memory, and you have to retrieve it. So the frontal, we think of that. Um, this precuneus, I don't know, it, it's you know part of the default network. so. Could be something to do with internal processing, but I, I one thing I learned a long time ago is not to attempt to interpret every single little lump that you see. It becomes very difficult. Um, this is the same data just shown in a 3D rendering, and uh, you notice, by the way, that uh, here it's a little more, it's considerably more posterior, but this is sort of the same area that we've seen before, that sens sensitive area. And uh, this area for imagery is located slightly more posterior. And you can see that uh, here. It's a little bit more posterior. So that's interesting. That shows that, um, or we think that the recruitment of this area of the brain is relevant for um, imagining sounds. And imagining something that isn't there we think is maybe the first step in creativity, right? Because if you're going to create something new, well, you have to imagine it, right? Um, however, to be truly creative, you can't just imagine something that you've previously experienced. You have to be able to um, make something new out of it. And so we thought, how do we get at that? How do we explore that question? Um, in other words, the, the idea that you can manipulate this information that you have could be one of the ways of uh, looking at uh, creativity. And so we came up with this task where you have to manipulate something that you know, in, in this case a familiar tune, by moving it around in time. So going from front to back. So here's a tune that you know probably even in Spain. This is very well known. Then what we do is we play the same tune backwards. Except that there was one note that was wrong. I hope you noticed. This is the correct note, the correct reversal. 
for that. So your job in this experiment is to listen to the normal version, then listen to the flipped version, mentally flip it back, compare it to the original, okay? Um, and we actually found people who could do this, so I, I don't have the data here, but I should say we selected people who could do this. We had to find a few, the, uh, these were all musicians, by the way. Um, and we scanned them um, during, so this is the scan procedure. Um, by the way, we always use this sparse sampling approach so, so that we can present our um, auditory stimuli in the silent period between scans. And uh, we scan them um, at a time when they're supposed to be mentally reversing this uh, stimulus. So we think we're capturing the moment in time when they're mentally manipulating the sound. And uh, to make a long story short, what we find is activity in, not in the auditory cortex, but in fact in the parietal lobe, which is shown here, it's shown here, as well as in a lot of other regions, but that's the re region we're most focusing on. Um, and this parietal cortex is interesting because um, it seems to be involved in many different functions, in particular, um, cognitive abilities that require some kind of manipulation or transformation of information. And that same task that I told you about earlier, which is the transposition task, uh, also activates the parietal lobe. And um, as Virginia was showing you, this is also sensitive to uh, musical training. So this is with functional MRI data. The activity in these regions, activity here, um, corresponds to the ability to perform this task. Uh, and let me just skip over all this. So here are two tasks. Well, I'll just show you this one thing. These two tasks are actually completely overlapping. So here are the um, reverse melodies that I showed you earlier. So you see the activity in the uh, parietal lobe. And here are the transposed melodies. And here's the overlap between them. So both of these tasks, which seem to have nothing to do with each other, are recruiting the same part of the brain. And that part of the brain is this area that I had, or this pathway that I had uh, mentioned to you earlier. So we're not in auditory regions anymore. We're in this dorsal stream, which connects first to uh, the parietal cortex and then to premotor and eventually to prefrontal regions. And what is the functionality of this pathway, this dorsal pathway uh, that also goes to the premotor regions? Well, if you look in monkey neurophysiology studies, you find that it's important for tasks like reaching, grasping, pointing, things like that. If you look in the cognitive literature, you find that it's relevant for tasks like mental rotation, visual mental rotation, uh, and also, uh, as uh, Dan has shown, um, in math types of tasks. And uh, what's in common with all of these is that they all require some kind of transformation of information from one reference frame into a different reference frame. So if I'm reaching for this object, right, the object is represented initially in my retina, um, but that information has to, be, has to be translated into a different um, coordinate frame so that I can act upon it with my motor system. Because I'm not reaching for my retina, I'm reaching for the object. So I have to know where that object is in space, not only in retinal space. So I have to convert that. Um, and similarly with things like mental rotation, right? You're mentally imagining the transformation of an object in space. And so what we think is that maybe these musical tasks also are similar. So basically in the visual domain, you're transforming information in these axes of spatial, spatial dimension, right? Horizontal and vertical axes. In the musical domain, we think maybe the axes are time and frequency so that a pattern of sounds is going to be changing in frequency over time. And if you transpose this, if you move it um, from one key to another, you're moving it in frequency space. And if you do this strange task of flipping it back and forth, you're actually transforming it in temporal, um, in the temporal dimension. And so we think that might be why we have this um, convergence uh, across these very, very different domains. So in my remaining 
12 minutes. Um, I really want to change uh, gears a little bit because I know that many of you are interested in aesthetics and therefore um, I want to talk a little bit about some work we've done with music and emotion. And this is, um, well, there's some old work, there's some new work, uh, but it's a kind of a different line of research from what I've spoken about so far. So, um, of course, you, you know, up until now we've talked about the analysis of picture information, the uh, ability to transform that picture information, the ability to imagine pictures and so on. But really, the most essential aspect of music has to do with emotion. If you just ask someone, if you go out on the street and you stop someone and you say, first of all, if you say, you know, do you like music, they'll say yes, almost certainly. And then um, if you ask them, well, why do you listen to music, they'll say, well, I just told you, because I like it. So in other words, it's some kind of affective response. They're going to tell you about uh, some kind of emotion. Uh, and in fact, if you look at surveys, for example, this was done by some colleagues uh, of mine at McGill. Uh, if you ask people to say what gives them pleasure, <coughs> you will find that, of course, romance gives them pleasure, sex gives them pleasure. If you live in Canada, sun gives you pleasure because <laughs> you don't get very much of it. Music is at 95%. It's, uh, of course, better than good grades, but it's surprisingly better than food, much better than music. Uh, much better than money, excuse me, for the sports people in the audience, I'm sorry. Um, and for the artists, I'm even sorrier because music beats art by a large percentage. So, um, you know, there are many aspects of music and emotion. We've focused on the pleasure aspect. But you can also use music to evoke displeasure or to evoke um, boredom or many other emotions. Now, what are things that are pleasure? What is, what is pleasure all about? There are many things that are pleasurable. Some of them are shown here. Um, I don't think you can do all of these in one day, but <laughs> maybe in Ibiza you could uh, possibly uh, do this. Uh, what they have in common is that um, in terms of the, their neural basis, is that they all involve the uh, activity in this uh, circuitry that's known as the mesolimbic region. And in particular, uh, they involve the dopaminergic circuitry in that part of the brain. So this involves uh, portions of the basal ganglia here. Now, what these stimuli have in common is that they're either necessary for survival, like food or sex, survival on an individual basis or survival at a species level, um, or else they are um, drugs that we know activate this dopaminergic system. In fact, that's why things like cocaine or um, barbiturates are extremely dangerous is because they have a direct influence on the dopaminergic system, giving people this very strong uh, pleasurable rush. Um, and then it's, it's very difficult to control. So these are, uh, this is, let's say, the common denominator of all of these pleasurable stimuli. So we wondered, is it possible that music uh, might also activate the same system? So to ask that question, we need to have a way of measuring musical pleasure. We can't just play music and say, you know, is it pleasurable? And what we came up with, um, this is work originally done by Anne Blood in my lab, we came up with the idea of studying the musical chills so these are escalofríos uh, musicales, which um, is fairly common. Most people have them, not everybody, but it's a very common thing. Um, and they're very useful to us as a way of studying musical pleasure because they are very specific, usually to a particular musical passage for any given person. So that means we know when it's going to happen, and therefore we can capture it in the lab. That's very important. Um, it's also useful to use because there are physiological changes, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and that means that we can validate the experience that the person is having on an objective basis. So, you know, in psychology, we always try to look at subjective phenomena using objective measures, right? And so we don't just rely on what the person tells us. We also look at something that we can measure. Um, and I just, I want to play you some music that people brought in. So the way we, w we do this is, you know, in every other experiment, we play these really boring, stupid stimuli that you've heard before. 
they don't usually give people pleasure. Um, for this experiment, we asked people to bring in the music that they found strongly pleasurable that gave them chills, that it was so wonderful for them that they had chills. So that means that we have to use different stimuli for different people. And the variety of stimuli is quite remarkable. That's what I want to illustrate for you. So this is one stimulus. for different folks. Here's uh, one that I find completely baffling, but someone really loved it. se usa en, en Galicia, ¿no? ¿Sí? Well, um, so this is just to show you how varied the music is. But what they have, what this music has in common is that it gives a very similar psychological and, as you'll see, physiological response. So first of all, psychologically, we ask people to indicate when they feel the chills. So in other words, what is the maximum pleasure that they experience? No more masking. That's very good. Um, and so what happens is uh, that when they indicate that there's a chill, this is when their uh, pleasure rating goes up. This is just subjective pleasure rating on a scale. Okay? And this is the control music. So this is uh, music that they didn't find pleasurable. And this is music that they did find pleasurable. And so of course, it's higher overall than the control. But importantly, when they feel the chill, that's when they say, oh, that's maximum pleasure, okay? Um, and then we measure various physiological uh, indices like skin conductance, temperature, heart rate, and so forth. This is work done by um, Valerie Talampur. And what we find is that the maximum pleasure, which occurs during chills, subjectively, also corresponds to maximum pleasure uh, physiologically. So the skin conductance changes, the heart rate goes up, respiration rate, et cetera, et cetera. And the one that goes down is the skin temperature. And that's why it's called chills, because the skin actually gets cold, right? So now we have a nice uh, correspondence between the, ra the uh, behavioral ratings and the um, physiology, telling us that something important is happening there, which is highly pleasurable. So based on that, we can now go to the scanner and see what's going on in the scanner. And we've done several experiments. I'll just tell you about the most recent one, which is the most relevant one, perhaps, which uses a uh, positron emission tomography technique, which is a little bit different than, it's, it's very completely different than the functional MRI. The way it works is that on one day, you hear the music that you think is really wonderful. On the other day, you hear neutral music. And these, this music is switched for other participants. So this music is the beautiful music of someone else so that we have it sort of balanced. And um, so we're using, uh, so we allow the person to listen to the music for um, 15 minutes. And the idea is that if there is dopamine that's being released during pleasure, you will have, so this is meant to be the synapse here, you will have the um, postsynaptic elements in this uh, mesolimbic region that will be uh, taken up with the dopamine molecules because a lot of them have been Whereas in the control case, 
there is a lot less dopamine released, and therefore there is a lot of um, open um, the receptor sites are available there. So then what we do is we inject a um, molecule, which is called ractopide, which is a synthetic molecule which binds to the dopamine receptors. So we inject it, and um, there are relatively few available sites in condition one, but there are a lot of available sites in condition two. So there should be a lot more rac ractopide accumulated here than here. And this ractopide is also um, uh, a tracer, so it has a carbon-11 molecule, which is um, a positron emitting molecule. So it's, it's a radioactive tracer. That means that we can measure it with positron emission tomography. So in the end, what we do is um, we uh, continue uh, uh, scanning and acquiring data for a full 60 minutes. So we acquire all this uh, image data. And at the end, we have a, an image which corresponds to the amount of labeled ractopide that's present in these two conditions. And then we do the usual comparison by overlapping the scans and then looking at the uh, difference between them. One thing I should mention is that ractopide as a tracer is very limited in its affinity in cortex. So we actually don't see, it's basically blind to the cortical dopamine. We're only really able to measure the dopaminergic response if it's there in the um, uh, deep uh, gray matter structures. So essentially in the basal ganglia. So the result, uh, in fact, is that there is uh, evidence for dopaminergic uh, response to pleasurable music uh, in these areas of the so-called striatum, which is the um, cottage decayment and uh, nucleus accumbens. But we noticed something interesting. So that in itself is, is good because that supports the idea that this is the this mesolimbic region that I spoke about earlier, the one that responds to drugs and food and so on, um, is also relevant for music. But we noticed that there were two subregions, one in the dorsal striatum, which is the, the anterior portion of the caudate, and another one in the ventral striatum, which is the um, medial portion of the decayment and in particular includes the nucleus accumbens. And why is that interesting or relevant? Well, there's a lot of literature that distinguishes functionally the dorsal from the ventral um, portions of the striatum. And um, because of that literature, which we can discuss later if you wish, we thought that the difference between these two regions might have to do with the time at which the response is occurring. So to look at that, we um, went back to fMRI because the, the PET technique, as you can see, sorry, as you can see here, the PET technique has very poor temporal resolution. We're looking, this image corresponds to the summed activity that was occurring over 60 minutes. So we don't know what's happening when. But what we did was we uh, scanned the same participants who had been in the PET experiment with fMRI, listening to the same music. And with fMRI, um, we can distinguish different moments of time. And so we distinguish between when the chills was occurring, when that peak was happening, versus the time period prior to those, that peak experience. And what we saw was that this, uh, in fact, dissociated the two subregions. So these are regions that are known to respond dopaminergically because of this finding. So we're only looking at those voxels that are already established to be dopaminergic. So we can join it with the fMRI data, and now we're looking at the bold signal in dopaminergic areas, and we see that the dorsal striatum is active during anticipation, whereas the ventral striatum is active during the peak pleasure. And if you look at the uh, time course here, that's what it shows you. So this line corresponds to the peak pleasure. This is when the chills start. For 15 seconds or so prior to that, we see the activity in the caudate, which is the dorsal striatum, and then it goes down, and then, um, in the uh, nucleus accumbens, the activity is lower during that anticip anticipatory period, but then it shoots up during the experience. And this is quite interesting because it fits with a lot of evidence from um, neurophysiological models of uh, so-called reward uh, expectancy. So this dorsal striatum system is supposed to be important for signaling 
that reward is coming. Whereas the ventral system is supposed to be signaling um, that reward is there, that you're experiencing this reward in the brain. And if you look at the connectivity of these systems, they're also interesting because the dorsal striatum is more linked to um, premotor regions and uh, frontal cortex, so areas that are involved in making anticipatory movements, essentially. So doing something in order to get the reward because you're anticipating that it's coming, whereas the ventral system is really linked to uh, mostly limbic regions, um, amygdala and uh, ventromedial frontal cortex, for example. So that's more involved with a purely emotional response. So one way we're thinking about this is that music, one reason why music is so powerful in its emotional, uh, in its ability to, to uh, elicit emotions is because in a way it's grabbing onto a very ancient evolutionary system which is there for a totally different reason. It's there in order for you to um, interact with your environment in a way to obtain rewarding uh, experiences. And music is a kind of a simulation of that, if you will. That as you're listening to music, you're constantly anticipating what's happening. You hear one set of sounds, they uh, lead you to make predictions about what's coming later. And then those predictions are either correct or not. And that leads to other predictions. As music unfolds, you're constantly playing with this uh, expectation and reward. And um, What's really fascinating to me is that if you look at the music theory literature, people have talked about this for 100 years, the idea of um, tension and resolution is a standard part of music theory. You have chords and you describe them in terms of you know, creating tension and then resolving that tension. And so that seems to map onto this anatomical distinction rather nicely. So just to conclude, the three major sort of points that I talked about, I think the brain is hardwired for music. Uh, I think there are specializations, certainly for pitch, probably for many other features as well. We've really focused a lot on pitch. And uh, these same regions, which are specialized, are um, probably changed anatomically by experience. Um, and we saw that from Virginia's studies as well, that there's very good evidence uh, for that. But um, at the same time, it, um, music is actually influenced by brain anatomy. So it goes back and forth. Um, in terms of imagery, what I've shown you is that one of the features of uh, imagery is that it involves a reactivation of sensory regions and that um, we think that this is one aspect of uh, creativity and that the interaction between these auditory regions, the ones that are specialized for pitch, and other regions like the parietal cortex might be particularly relevant for being able to create new things because it allows you to manipulate those things. You have them, you, have, you know them, and you now are able to order them in different ways. And finally, um, the question of why music gives us pleasure, well, we've shown that dopamine seems to mediate this pleasurable response, and this association, both in anatomically in terms of two different structures and temporally in terms of anticipation versus experience, seems to be uh, a very important part, not the only one by any means, but a very important part of why music seems to be so pleasurable. Um, and so I hope I've convinced you that studying the brain is relevant for music and studying music is relevant for the brain. And I just want to thank all the many uh, collaborators and students. Um, they actually do all of the real work. I just get to visit beautiful islands in the Mediterranean, and uh, it's very nice. And uh, that's it, thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh-huh. Yeah, that is a really interesting question. Well, maybe it would be. Um, it would very, it would be very interesting. I think it might be harder than you think <laughs> to control it. 
um, I know that I have once or a few times experienced chills when I'm imagining music. It's not usually as strong as um, doing real music. But, um, but yes, I, do, I think that uh, maybe one aspect of cognition which is interesting is that, um, like I was alluding to, you can recreate previous experiences, right? So if you recreate them well enough, you might in fact get the same physiological responses to it. And that might be an index of how vivid your experience is. And I suspect that that's something that would vary a lot from one person to another. I, th and that would be the part that would be interesting, interesting to study is why some people might be better at it than others, or could you train it? You know? Imagery is something that's not usually trained directly, um, but you could give people training on it and, uh, and see if that results in a better emotional response. So yeah, that would be quite interesting. Yes, yes, and the more you listen to something, usually the more pleasure you get out of it. However, I'll tell you we have one new study, which I can show you later if you want, where we, we were looking at that question. So we gave people completely new music that we were sure they had never heard, and we asked them to tell us if they really liked it or they didn't. They actually had to pay money to buy it or not. And then we looked at the uh, fMRI signal for the pieces that were um, assigned a lot of value versus the pieces that were not assigned much value. And they were all novel. They had never been heard before. And we, we compared those two. We see a signal in the striatum, both ventral and dorsal striatum. So it seems like that um, reward system is not uniquely linked to familiar events. You can also get activity in that same system the very first time you experience something. So it's not only for uh, something that you already have experience with. Imagery, yeah. The what and where. Yes. Yes. Yes and no. Um, so there's this very uh, important distinction between the dorsal pathway and the ventral pathway that was originally made by Ungerleder and Mishkin in the visual system. And uh, people have also tried to apply it to the auditory system. And the distinction is, it's known as what versus where because the dorsal system is thought to be the visual spatial system, whereas the ventral one is the visual object system. So on the one hand, um, these, uh, the visual experiments, like on mental rotation, support the idea that the dorsal system is spatial. Um, what um, we're seeing on these tasks I don't think can be characterized as spatial qua spatial because you're not operating in space. You're not grabbing something. It's not in three dimensional, it's not in real space. But it might be in some kind of a cognitive space. And so that diagram I showed of frequency versus time, if you want to call that a space in a very abstract sense, that's fine. Uh, and, and another way to think about it, or the way I like to think about it, <clears throat> and, I, and I hate to even suggest evolutionary scenarios in general, but especially not with an audience of people who are interested in evolution. But if I can just speculate, I like the idea that the system may have developed to solve a visual motor problem. In other words, um, 
the ability to grasp an object is so fundamental that I could see that there might be selective advantage to developing a system that allows you to do that. But once you have that system in place, you could also think of a kind of an exaptation that takes the um, computations that are going on in that system, which have to do these transformations from one reference frame to another, you could take that same mechanism and operate on a completely different input. So in our case, on the musical input. So in other words, um, they may be related at that level that what that, um, I'm not sure if I'm expressing myself clearly, but the idea would be that this, this uh, function of transforming from one reference frame to another could be a very general function that could be applied in many different domains. And it does apply to the musical domain. And there are some people who talk about it in the uh, language domain as well. So things like generative uh, phonology or stuff like that. Well, uh, it's, the, it's the dorsal motor theory as opposed to the ventral motor theory. Yeah. Sure. I think that's a very uh, reasonable way to look at it. Um, when I say that it's specialized for music, I do not imply, I don't mean to imply uh, that there was necessarily selective advantage for music. Um, there was probably selective advantage for many other components. So like pitch, for example, um, you know, it's it's found in the marmoset monkey, which doesn't have any music, right? Um, but, so why would it be useful? Well, uh, one thing that's really interesting is that if we look in a natural acoustic environment, the only sounds that have periodicity, that is to say pitch, are sounds created by another creature. So the sounds of the environment are not periodic. Wind, water, rain, trees, you know, rocks, whatever. Um, they're noise, right? They're aperiodic. The only periodic sounds are produced by vocal tracks. So you can see the advantage right there instantly on the basis of identifying conspecifics, of, a, of identifying predator or prey, and also in terms of segregating um, in the acoustic environment a, um, a relevant signal from a background noise, right? So all of that would be quite sufficient to drive the development of a specialized system that has nothing really to do with, you know, cognitive musical sorts of principles. So I like that, I like that kind of explanation. Um, it seems to make sense. Well, one thing that we see very, very uh, Consistently, and I, I mentioned it at the beginning, but I, I didn't really talk about it, is this difference between the specialization of the right auditory cortex and the left. And of course, we know very well that the left auditory cortex and other areas are specialized for speech. And it seems really from our data and from a lot of other labs that there's a very clear specialization in the right for uh, with pitch analysis. Um, and my interpretation of that is, is again, not um, not based on a kind of domain specific idea. It's based on a much lower level idea that um, the right auditory cortex is specialized for pitch because um, in order to uh, be able to process pitch, you need to sample the signal for long enough that you have a clear, um, uh, you have sufficient 
data to, to uh, look at the frequency distribution of the signals. Um, if you have a very short sampling window, you will have a spectrally very smeared representation. And if you look at music versus speech, they seem to exploit different points on that space. So speech is basically broadband sounds that alternate very quickly, right? So a fast processor that is not spectrally precise is good. Whereas uh, on the right, music actually tends to be slower and uh, pitch relationships are much more important in uh, music than in speech. Even for tonal languages, that's true. And so the right side might have a, a slower processor that is more uh, spectrally precise. So it might be this kind of um, uh, trade-off between temporal precision and spectral precision. And I think that probably is something that antecedes the development of either speech or music. It's probably you know, found in many other Um, what we've done with, with rhythm is more along the lines of uh, what Virginia was talking about. So we've looked at, um, I should say, I guess we were sort of, or I was sort of forced to uh, find out something about the motor system because whenever we started to look at rhythm, we started to find a very strong interaction with the motor system. And uh, Virginia was mentioning earlier these studies that were done by um, George Chen, who's a student that worked with us. And uh, among the basic findings that she was looking at was the idea that whenever you have to um, basically represent a temporal sequence that has some kind of um, metrical structure, you always involve the motor system. So she did one experiment, for example, where people were um, not moving at all. They were just listening to temporally ordered sounds, actually the same ones, the same stimuli that you played. And um, we found activity in the premotor cortex, uh, which was present uh, stronger and stronger as the stimuli were more metrically organized. The left-right differences we didn't see in those experiments, they were pretty bilateral, right? <laughs> but um, when you say the right side of the brain is the most common and the most associated with performance of the motor system, and the bilateral differences that you see in the brain is the most bilateral differences, then why can't you say that the brain is the most common and most associated with performance of the motor system? Because the brain is the most common and most associated with performance of the motor system, and the left side of the brain is the most common and most associated. Different scale. We could probably we could probably agree that it's not uh, all that clear. One way to summarize <laughs> that's an easy way to summarize any area. Thank you.